Okay, take it away, Aaron Beatty. Today I'll be presenting the material on Sword 1N, material that is getting manuscript. Time permits, I'd also like to present some of the Sword 1N material from the mounted section as well. So the one poster that's here that Barry shows for the Sword 1N, we have longer or left tail refused, and he says to step off the line and then deflect across. So if we have an increasing, uh, if we have a fendente that's coming in, we come to here. Not being nice because Duncan isn't wearing a mask, but I like to think of this as actually coming out and striking in a single time defensive attack similar to the first play of longsword. If we do that again, I can thrust, I can cut, we're a little bit closer. I can push the hand, cut, and thrust. We're a little bit closer still. I can actually push the elbow all the way around and then come in and capture, which we'll see again in the instance when we're in armor, as well as the bees. Well, I see this motion as very similar to what we just saw with dagger versus sword, and also sword versus dagger. Now we have another option, which I see as if my partner is going back, then coming in for the third play of wrestling. Although it isn't mentioned this in the text, I like to think that we're actually coming in and sustaining the, the weapon as well. Next, we can go to the other side, either entering in or having our partner actually taking the center, which I see is similar to the second play of longsword, in which case we can strike the other side, we can blade grab, we can grab the wrist, we can grab the pommel, we can grab this wrist, which now is similar to the Mandrita play of dagger. And from here, we can also pommel, although he might come in with his left hand to block this, similar to the first play of Mandrita. We can retract and thrust. We can also enter into middle key, but we have to watch, because this is a sharp blade, which if I'm overly aggressive, would cut my leg. So I see this is the middle key, trying to keep the blade at distance, and then being able to see other things. Next, here the very says that if I strike to the head, instead of coming up and deflecting like I was showing, he says to actually beat it. Down to the ground, and if we do that again, and I keep the blade down in front of me, he shows stepping on the blade, then pushing the elbow, and then capturing, which we saw just a minute ago, and which we'll see again in the case of their anomaly. He also has this for a thrust. Laid down to the ground, stepping on it, pushing it across, and then capturing. We do this again. Although it is shown in the text in this section, I like to think that it would be logical to also cut up under the beard, as we see in the long certain section. Coming back to the initial cross. From here, we can also grab and twist, although it isn't specifically mentioned. I like to think that we can also come in and give either this disarm from the long sword section or kick it across here. But that's extrapolation from other sections in the manuscript. Next, if I'm in armor, he says you can just half sword and thrust. Of course, here, if I'm not in armor, I have this sharp blade coming in, and this would be unwise. So those are the parts of the sword in one hand uh, section of the Getty manuscript that I prepared for presentation for today. Thank you. Um, please, please continue with the rest uh, with whatever else you wanted to. You mentioned sword and armor, uh, 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 the mounted. Yes, so a few months back we were looking at the, uh, the mounted section and there was a lot of interesting information there uh, that relates back to what I just presented to the Sword of 1S. So in the mounted section, instead of just showing the one poster, and I'm going to pretend I have a horse in front of me, which is why I have my left hand here, <coughs> he has Longa, which we were just looking at, Boar's Tooth, and he also has uh, <coughs> left posted it on him. So, if we go back again and I have a cut or a thrust, let's do a cut. 
Instead of going on a more upward trajectory, you have to clear your horse's head. You come across, and you can thrust, you can cut, and he also states you can capture it, or in this case, do a clothesline throw. Moving to the Morris Tooth, it says you can also do these actions from here. My interpretation, or uh, my provost's inter interpretation, is a false edge deflection, a cross, in which case you have a cut, you have a thrust, and depending on the distance, you also have a throw. Then going to post a dot on the left, with a cut, we also have a cut, a thrust, and a throw. So, reflecting back to the sword in one hand, unmounted, you could argue that what we've seen from left tail could actually be added onto with actions from boar's tooth and from left posted on. Next, in the mounted section with the sword in one hand, as Duncan comes in for a strike, we see a hook, which we do not see in the other sections. I interpret this to be because my left hand is busy, I cannot have another hand engaged, so I have to rely on this hand and come over. Similarly, his hand is engaged, so he can't just come in and do other things, and he has less structure than he would have if he had two hands on, his, uh, on the, uh, the palm. If Duncan and I change spots, and he does that play back to me. <clears throat> so, I strike, Duncan starts low, comes up, and he goes to hook. So in this part of the manuscript, it's vague. It says, I turn my sword and his blade goes to the ground. We're not sure what that means. One interpretation could be, you come up and over. Again, we're not sure. This is something that we tried. It seems to make sense, but we're not sure. Again, nice and slow, I come in. Duncan goes to do that action, and in that time, I might be able to do this and gain the action. <coughs> the next play, if Duncan throws me a thrust, sorry, a cut, uh, from uh, Pulsman on, good. So, the next one, uh, he says this come counters all of the plays before, where I actually come in and do a pommel strike before he can do any of his actions. I would want to do it here. Pommel strike, and I believe it also says a tondo after the action. Now, if I strike Duncan, Duncan defends and tries to do that back to me. So he tries to do this. Uh, sorry, pommel strike. No, that's my, my mistake. So pommel strike, here in the very set, shows a picture with the hilt being used to block the pommel strike. And then he says, I turn my sword to strike. That's cool. Right? And again? So I'm going to strike, you're going to defend and try to palm strike. So I strike, defend, palm strike, block the hilt, and then I come across. Again, we're uncertain of that, but we're going from the picture. So I see these plays as adding from the mounted section as adding to the sword in one hand unmounted section and providing context. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I, I think you expressed the themes pretty well. I thought that was great. So my question is actually going to be um, to talk a little bit about the initiative that you took to factor in some of the theory and the plays in the mounted section. Because we didn't actually offer the mounted section formally as an option to take up. And that's probably a mistake, and we'll should probably remedy that next time. But can you just talk a little bit about uh, how you think the mounted section material can be understood by us who are learning it on foot. Unless you, did you get a horse to do the mounted section? You didn't. Nope. Right. So, when we do our scholar-only sessions in Guelph, we explore the material first, we present our thoughts to our provost, and then he tells us where we are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> As we should. And we're always looking across the different materials. And lately, we've been looking at what's missing as well as what's there. So if you see a section where they're missing things that are, seem obvious from other plays, then we question each other on why that might be, and we test it. We try it, and we see what works and what doesn't work. 
So providing context and saying, well, in other sections as we've seen today, the universal counter with the left hand coming in and pushing the elbow would be used or to be involved for two hands on for a lock or for a key. We said, well, in this case, we don't have that. We're steering our horse, which might be why we rely on these actions. Could that be used in a sword in one hand uh, unmounted boat? Sure. Would it be as good as having a second hand on? No. But perhaps you'd be able to use that tool. Cool. Thank you, Beatty. Uh, so I'll, I'll do what I've, I'll give you some advice. Um, with respect to extrapolations of the material, in your presentation, my recommendation would be to present the core uh, canon, so to speak, uh, clearly and initially, and then very clearly demarcate thereafter where you're starting to extrapolate. Um, because this, uh, this allows anyone who's observing to clearly understand that you have a, a, a firm grasp on the, on the canon material and then you're moving beyond it to thereafter, just as from a presentation standpoint. Thank you. Yeah, my, I would have a little advice too from the perspective of the presentation. A lot of, in sort of early on, you would say, and from here, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. So what I would like to see is, that's great, but show each one individually so you can actually go through and clearly demonstrate that you are confident in doing that play. So in, in some sort of smooth time. Me? Oh boy. Okay. Um, earlier on, when you were showing uh, plays uh, on, on foot, you kept referring to capture because you were putting your sword across the chest. Um, is that what the text says? So I believe the text says in the initial action to cut the throat in an unarmored context. And then later, uh, if you were an armor, then you can beat the sword. And then I believe in that section it says, then you can capture. Okay. So I think there's two different references to two different actions. Okay. Um, so in terms of the explanation, when you were, if you were teaching this to recruits, and you kept putting your sword across the shoulder, you'd have a class full of people capturing each other, as opposed to doing what the master says in the book. So my preference would be for you to show what's in the book as opposed to what you see later on in a different context. And since you took on the inenviable task of actually looking at the mounted section where we do get a lot of information about how to use the sword in one hand, um, it didn't appear that you factored the horse into any of your explanations. Why would the horse different than on the foot. Obviously, you're pulled higher up and stuff like that. But what about the mountain section sword in one hand is different than the one on the foot? That's a very good question. Thank you. So with my limited experiences on horse and from what I've been taught, being able to keep in mind that you've got a horse's head in front of you and that they're moving uh, very, very clearly in one direction, you have to cut above the horse's head, which is where I like to have the, the left hand reminding me of that, and then the direction of movement and whether we're moving to either side, <clears throat> on one side or on the other side. So in the manuscript, Pierre de la Berry gives us clear instruction on actions that are uh, better if they're on your right side, such as the clothesline throw with the right arm. And then he also is very clear that the actions that we're doing with what I think of as a universal sword in one hand cover can also be done against people coming from the other direction. Fair enough. All right, thank you very much, Beatty.